testing now, great. Welcome, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you to the UCSF divisions of hospital medicine, anesthesia critical care medicine, and pulmonary critical care medicine, as well as the California Thoracic Society for co-sponsoring this webinar today. The goal is to really get some practical nitty gritty pearls for the clinical management of inpatients treating patients with COVID-19. And this webinar is targeted towards practicing hospitalists, intensivists, trainees, really anyone taking care of inpatients with COVID-19. Thank you to my co-moderator, Dr. Aaron Gordon, for being the inspiration for this webinar. This is the format. I will introduce a series of experts through a narrative patient case, and then ask them questions regarding management pearls. At the end, we're gonna use the Q&A button to ask questions of our panelists that we'll discuss at the end of the hour. So thank you all for joining us and let's get right to it. Our patient is a 47-year-old woman. She has a history of hypertension and she's presenting to the ER with fevers, chills, malaise, and a dry cough. She's found to be hypoxic and requires four liters nasal cannula. She's admitted to the UCSF Respiratory Isolation Unit or the RIU. So first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Armand Esmaili from the Division of Hospital Medicine, who is the director of our Respiratory Isolation Unit, which was newly created for the care of hospitalized inpatients with COVID-19. Dr. Esmaili, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. First, I'd love to hear your perspective on what is the actual benefit of geographically cohorting these patients on a specific unit. Yeah, I think there are three big benefits to highlight. There's safety, there's expertise, and then there's a culture or camaraderie on the unit. Just to give you a little bit of perspective of our respiratory isolation unit, it's a single geographic unit that has about 30 beds here. Uh, we have three daytime hospitalists who are here and one overnight hospitalist, and they're admitting suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases from the ED. This is a unit where providers badge into the unit to start their shift. They stay here for the remainder of their shift. Um, and then they're either keeping and caring for COVID positive patients uh, if, uh, on this unit, or if they rule out, they're moving them off to, to other units. So I think there's a clear safety uh, component here as well. We're cohorting all of our COVID positive patients in one unit in the hospital. All the providers here are extensively trained in PPE. I think the other key component is expertise. Um, we know that COVID is a unique and novel illness for all of our providers. And so having the opportunity to cohort physicians, nurses, PCAs, respiratory therapists in one acute care unit develops a level of comfort and clinical expertise for everyone involved um, that then can be disseminated to other providers and experts. Uh, in addition to the operations and logistics, I, I think we can't lose sight of the unique camaraderie and culture that you have on a unit. Um, there is a, a spirit and an ethos behind a common mission to care for COVID positive patients. So I'd highlight the safety, the expertise, and the culture uh, are really key features of our unit. Thank you so much for highlighting those. That definitely sounds like a good benefit and a good rationale for geographic cohorting. Tell me about if a patient unfortunately deteriorates, what are your criteria that you use for transferring to the intensive care unit? I'll say the, the biggest thing first is just, I think the pulmonary trajectory is what worries us the most. Um, I'm not an infectious disease or, or a pulmonary critical care expert like you. And I think just to acknowledge that a lot of our knowledge and understanding of the clinical trajectory of patients is still quite novel. Um, we do have some emerging evidence. We have to rely on some of our own anecdotal experience. I think just looking at the literature and being in the mindset of our hospitalists here, I think we certainly look for comorbidities for a patient, older patients, more comorbidities. Um, but I think it's the clinical trend, that clinical sense of what is happening with this patient's hypoxia? Um, uh, that is the biggest worry for our patients where they may um, be developing ARDS and need to head to the ICU. So one is just the clinical sense and understanding of the trajectory. And I think what's really important for other systems to understand and has been important for us is making sure we have a clear system 
to care for patients if we have concern for their trajectory. So patients who are coming into the ED with oxygen requirements are often evaluated by ICU triage. Uh, once they're here on our acute care unit, this is not an intensive care unit. Uh, we have ICU triage, rapid response team, keeping a sense, an eye on patients uh, who might have clinical worsening. Um, and, and we have a system that if, if, uh, if a patient trajectory is worsening, we can closely involve our ICU colleagues uh, for care escalations. So I would say it's just I think the hypoxia is what worries us the most and making sure providers have a clinical sense of the trajectory and know what our system is to be able to escalate care. That makes a lot of sense. Looking a little bit ahead to a preview that we'll discuss a little bit more later on in the talk, what do you think about safe discharge planning? How do your hospitals handle that? I think two key things are just first the hospital's perspective of, of assessing clinical stability. And then the second is uh, hospitals working really closely with the huge care team uh, to come up with uh, a safe plan out of the hospital. From the clinical stability, I, I just want to acknowledge that uh, you know, we have heard and seen here evidence of, of patients having kind of worsening hypoxia later into their disease course, maybe about starting in the second week of, of symptoms, uh, since symptom onset. And so I think just one thing to acknowledge is that I think we want to see patients are having an improving trend before making the de clinical determination that they're safe to leave the hospital. In terms of the keys for discharging patients, I think first is just doing a really extensive, comprehensive psychosocial understanding of the patient's needs. Who are their household contacts? Who are their caregivers that are important to provide care? Um, who's gonna help monitor symptoms? And then also having an understanding at our institution, um, if a, once a patient is discharged, uh, how care will be escalated in the outpatient setting. We're fortunate here, we have a very coordinated system of outpatient pulmonary docs like you and invested primary care physicians, but I think for other institutions, understanding what is that post-discharge support network and guide to be able to guide patients and their families after discharge is really important. Thank you so much, Dr. Ismaili, for going through those pearls. Now, let's get back to our patient case. Unfortunately, the patient's oxygen requirement starts to escalate from four liters to non-rebreather, ultimately requiring high-flow nasal cannula. He's transitioned, she's transitioned to the intensive care unit. Next panelist, we have Dr. Matt Aldrich, who's trained as a cardiac anesthesiologist and who's the director of critical care at UCSF. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Aldrich. Happy to be with you. How is UCSF managing the hypoxemic patient with COVID in the ICU? How are you thinking specifically about things like high flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation, proning, and things like that? So in general, I would say we're thinking about the critically ill patient with COVID-19 much the way we do any of our critically ill patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, we, um, recognizing that there are some additional challenges with the donning and doffing of PPE and the, the time it takes to safely manage PPE, um, we are still trying to adhere to the, to the core principles that we've always followed um, with, with regard to the management of these patients. So for instance, in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure, we do consider uh, high flow nasal cannula to be appropriate and a useful tool. Um, we've used it on many of our patients thus far. In, in several patients, it's uh, allowed us to avoid intubation altogether, and they've ultimately been discharged from the ICU without requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. Um, we use it in a negative pressure room in the ICU. Uh, we treat it as a high risk aerosol generating procedure, uh, even though I think the data are somewhat unclear on the actual degree of risk associated with high flow nasal cannula. We do not require a mask um, uh, to be worn by the patient over the high flow nasal cannula, the way some hospitals have, um, have decided to, to do. Um, and, and we found it to be successful. Um, Non-invasive ventilation, we have used less frequently, I think in part driven by the data in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure that shows uh, high flow nasal cannula to be superior to, to non-invasive ventilation. But in some patients who have specific indications that are evidence-based, uh, COPD exacerbations or CHF exacerbations, those are patients where we have considered and used um, non-invasive ventilation. Although I'll acknowledge we have less um, experience specifically with the use of non-invasive um, 
in patients with COVID-19, but we still consider it to be a tool that we could use. We've used awake proning some um, in a couple of patients who have been on high flow nasal cannula. We've used awake proning throughout the day, and we found it to be helpful, at least in terms of, um, of improvements in their oxygenation. Uh, hard for me to say, though, what the, the true benefits are, because we just have limited experience at this point. Thanks so much for going over that. What clinical indications do you talk about and think about when you're intubating a patient with COVID-19? And what other medications do you have in your toolbox at that point? Well, we certainly want to avoid, um, you know, given the concerns around appropriate and safe use of, of PPE, we want to avoid uh, urgent emergent situations to the extent possible. But that said, our approach to who we intubate um, is consistent with how we've approached intubation in critically ill patients for many years. So we are considering their gas exchange abnormalities, uh, the work of breathing, um, whether they have a, a, the ability to protect their airway. Those are all the, the usual factors. And, and a lot of this is it's ultimately a judgment call about when we think it's appropriate. Um, I, we certainly are not taking, uh, I think many of you have probably heard about the sort of the extremes, the, you know, the approach where everybody gets intubated early because they're inevitably going to need to get intubated and that was certainly circulated in many posts and social media uh, driven accounts. Um, we have not taken that approach nor have we taken the approach that um, mechanical ventilation will will be um, inevitably harmful to a patient and they have no ability they will have no ability to be weaned from the ventilator uh, and therefore delay intubation. That's also not been um, an extreme that we have found either evidence for in our own practice. Um, and, and I can say at this point, I mean, granted, I think we should acknowledge at UCSF, we really have, have been, we've had the good fortune um, to have had a relatively small number of patients. Um, and, and we've had, so we've had the luxury of our resources and, and time to think carefully about our patients. Um, and because of that, um, We've, we've been able to, to practice in our, in our usual manner. And this is, of course, different from places that are in the midst of a, of a crisis and a surge and, and don't have that same, that same luxury. So I acknowledge that, but with that in mind, we've been, we've been able to, to follow our standard evidence-based approach. I think the one thing I will say is when, when, when you approach induction and intubation of these patients, preparedness is key. Um, it's challenging to go in and out of the room um, and to get uh, medications that you need, additional equipment. So I think that requires a, a pre-procedural checklist and a huddle. And that's what we've been doing before we go into the room so that we have vasopressors that are in line for, to manage uh, peri-induction, hypotension. You know, for us, we approach almost all of these uh, intubations with norepinephrine available and in line available for both um, infusion and, and bolus dosing, making sure that we have all the airway equipment um, that we need, and then using experienced providers. This is not the time for an inexperienced trainee uh, to be performing intubation. You want an experienced airway provider at our institution that's been either at the fellow or the attending level, um, and that has worked well for us. We've been able to perform these um, intubation procedures safely and and, and um, and I, I wouldn't say we've had any major concerns with that. Um, but again, we've been able to also rely on the experience of other institutions, and we've certainly borrowed heavily from other institutions and from their experience and have adjusted our protocols accordingly. Thanks so much for going over that. When is it appropriate to consider transfer to, say, an ECMO center or even a lung transplant center? So I think this is a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, we have, I think at this point, accepted um, three patients for consideration of ECMO, and these were patients who came from centers that um, uh, did not have the ability to offer ECMO. We have not yet, however, cannulated any patient uh, for ECMO. I certainly think using similar criteria that we've used prior to this, I mean, patients with, uh, um, with severe uh, ARDS are, are certainly appropriate for consideration of transfer. Um, and so we've generally used our same criteria. I think the, the one question that, that we have considered is what the appropriate time on, what length of time in mechanical ventilation would be considered an appropriate exclusion criteria for ECMO. And I, um, 
ELSO has used seven days. Many of the institutional protocols that I've seen from around the country, the world have used a similar time frame. I think what we're actively considering is whether there may be some circumstances in which going beyond that time frame, maybe out to 10 or 12 days would be, would be appropriate. Um, but in general, I would say that the earlier, the better to at least initiate conversations with a center that could consider ECMO. Um, one, just because of the risk of transport, uh, assuming that, that there is no ECMO to go program or something of that nature. Um, and, um, and two, just because it allows the, the, the accepting institution to, to think about what the best time frame is um, for, for cannulation for ECMO, if that were to be the decision um, that they were gonna pursue. Thank you so much, Dr. Aldrich. Unfortunately, our patient becomes more hypoxemic and is ultimately intubated using those best practices that you described. He's placed, she's placed on the ARDSnet protocol for ventilation. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Gotts, a pulmonary critical care physician and co-director of our medical intensive care unit and author of a recent Lancet paper on the management of ARDS in patients with COVID-19. Thanks, Dr. Gotts, for joining us. Thanks for having me. So we've seen a lot of reports that COVID-19 respiratory failure might not be ARDS. Could you talk to us and kind of set the record straight about what interventions you recommend for patients with COVID and ARDS based on the literature so far? Yeah, this, this notion uh, that has gained traction in social media that COVID-19 pneumonia is not ARDS strikes me as just crazy. I mean, I don't think there's another word for it. Uh, it clearly meets <clears throat> the imaging and physiologic criteria that are laid out in the consensus definitions of ARDS. Uh, the pathology specimens so far confirm extensive diffuse alveolar damage, which is the pathologic you know, uh, finding in ARDS. And the mechanism um, clearly involves viral infection of alveolar epithelial cells uh, and subsequent immune-associated injury. It's no different than H1N1 influ H1 influenza or other types of viral pneumonia. And uh, you know, for those of us who've been around a while, the H1N1 pandemic frequently caused viral pneumonia of this kind of severity that we're seeing with COVID including cytokine storm, high incidence of DVT and PE, and uh, a long run on the ventilator, 10 to 14 days before uh, the hypoxemia began to get better. I think what's been mostly you know, frequently highlighted in social media that strikes people as unusual is the relatively preserved compliance in the face of profound hypoxemia. And uh, you know, in our experience with COVID, the compliance that we've seen has been quite heterogeneous and uh, overlaps broadly with the compliance of patients in, uh, uh, in the large clinical trials we participated in with ARDS from various causes. I think the splitting of patients into two groups based on compliance as has been suggested by Gattinoni and others seems to suggest that these patients might reasonably be treated differently. I think we should be really careful here and, and be clear that this is a hypothesis that hasn't been tested yet. What we know from the last few decades um, is that the lungs that have already suffered a mild injury from some cause can easily be progressively injured by mechanical ventilation. And this undisputed fact underlies our recommended approach uh, for using standard evidence-based supportive care for ARDS. Uh, and as Matt uh, Aldrich mentioned, we first try to avoid mechanical ventilation with a trial of high flow. Uh, and once intubated, we uh, implement low tidal volume ventilation as studied in the ARMA trial, the 2001 New England Journal trial, with the true volume control mode targeting 60 C per kilogram, ideal body weight, plateau pressure less than 30. And you know, the optimal PEEP setting remains unclear after several decades of study. We tend to use the low PEEP FiO2 grid that was used in ARMA um, as a default mode, but in patients with central obesity uh, requiring a high FiO2, we may try uh, the, the high PEEP FiO2 grid that was studied in the subsequent alveoli trial. Um, and infrequently when the physiology is confusing, we may use an esophageal balloon uh, to estimate pleural pressures to help guide PEEP. Um, paralysis, based on the results of the recent ROSE trial, which we participated in, we reserve paralytics for ventilator dyssynchrony and refractory hypoxemia. And uh, manual proning is considered for most patients with a PF in a 100 to 150 range. Uh, though, you know, for this audience, uh, the, for each facility, the familiar to the staff with these procedures and the consumption of PPE are, are gonna need to be taken into consideration. Uh, and then in terms of nitric, uh, we, we reserve nitric for patients with really severe hypoxemia and or significant RV dysfunction uh, based on several decades of experience with nitric demonstrating no improvement in, uh, in survival in ARDS. Uh, 
we all know it improves oxygenation. So, you know, you can use it for that, but don't, don't kid yourself that this is likely to be different than our long experience with this um, therapy. Uh, and as Matt mentioned, we, you know, ECMO is on the list. We are, you know, have criteria similar to Yolia, uh, but we haven't found the right patient yet. That sounds good. You know, practically, are there tips to really adhere to the low tidal volume ventilation? How do we encourage everyone to really stick with that, even with challenges such as sedation? Yeah, I think it's a real challenge. And, you know, at each institution, you know, there's this particular culture of what people use for the ventilator strategy. So uh, there's a lot of facilities that use dual modes like APV on the Hamilton, uh, PRVC. And those, I would be really careful with those. Um, you know, if you're not, if you don't, um, if your residents don't know about double stacking dyssynchrony, um, you, you know, you know, you need to try volume control here. This is what was studied. This is how you can best determine what the compliance of the lungs is and minimize uh, the, the volumes. Uh, and that requires really aggressive sedation up front and often at least a short um, uh, use of uh, paralytics to sort of, sort of catch up so the patients aren't so acidemic and have a, a little bit less uh, drive to breathe and over breathe on the vent. That sounds good. And what about thinking about your approach to extubation? Is your approach different from patients without COVID-19 or what are some special considerations you might be thinking of? Um, yeah, so you know, I don't think our approach, uh, as Matt said, is, is any different than our typical approach to extubation readiness with probably one important caveat, which is that you know, the threshold to enter the room is higher. So for patients who are likely to require a lot of uh, aggressive pulmonary um, suctioning uh, and help from respiratory therapy post extubation, you know, patients with a high secretion burden and or a, a low mental status, uh, our, our threshold is higher. They, they have to, uh, we have to think they're gonna fly on their own for the first hour or so and not need a lot of attention right away. And then frequent questions that are coming up constantly and ever evolving. What is your approach to say corticosteroids and anticoagulation in these patients? Yeah, this has really been really interesting to follow. And I've, I've done some basic science work with influenza. Uh, and uh, you know, this is not a new question, of course, in ARDS or in viral mediated ARDS. Uh, there's no question that steroids reduce inflammation. Uh, but I would submit to the audience, uh, there's several reasons to avoid them now outside new high quality RCT evidence. Um, I mean, the first is experience with H1N1 with steroids. This was tried, you know, several large meta-analyses published in the 2010s um, indicated worse outcomes in propensity score match populations. I mean, granted, we didn't have really good RCTs, but the, what we had suggested it wasn't a great idea. Uh, we know that it causes impaired viral clearance, which is a sort of public health and PPE issue as well as a, a clinical one. Um, it causes myopathy. And I think, uh, you know, on the basic science end, there, uh, there is a growing recognition that, um, you know, their inflammation is obviously complicated. Uh, after there is a lot of tissue destruction, there is also a need to clean that up and have tissue repair. And that is increasingly understood to be driven by um, active processes of resolution and steroids block that too. So, you know, we're interfering with not just bad inflammation, but the normal responses of the lung uh, to, to, to fixing the mess that's been left. Uh, so our, our approach with steroids is we, we use them for refractory distributive shock uh, and then we try to titrate them off. And, and until there's more evidence, I don't, I don't think many of us are going to be using uh, the bull of steroids that a lot of centers are, 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 are using. Sounds good. Thank you. And how often, how long is the course of mechanical ventilation in these patients typically? Uh, you know, in our experience so far, it's, it's exactly like pandemic, like real influenza pneumonia, um, which is about 10 to 14 days before there's much improvement. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, when people see this as being really different, it's important to recognize that a lot of what people think is viral pneumonia is not probably really viral pneumonia in the sense that the alveoli have been infected by the virus uh, and have been destroyed by the immune system. A lot of it is people who test positive with the PCR, uh, but have mostly upper respiratory um, involvement by the virus, and then had a bacterial pneumonia. And those patients get better fast. Um, but you know, patients with real viral pneumonia, they take two weeks to get better. And that's certainly been our experiencing a long duration of mechanical ventilation in some cases. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gotts, for your time. Let's get Thanks. back to our patient. Our patient had a baseline creatinine of 0.6, but unfortunately within the first 48 hours, that creatinine rose to 1.98. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kathleen Liu, co-director of our medical intensive care unit, who specializes in both nephrology and critical care. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Thanks, Lakshmi. Could you talk to us about your experience and observations of the clinical presentation of renal failure 
in patients with COVID-19 and how it might be similar or different to typical viral pneumonia? Yeah, so I think overall we now know that, or it seems that the presentation of acute kidney injury is very similar in COVID-19 to other forms of viral pneumonia. I think early on, we have, may have thought that the incidence was a little bit lower. Specifically, if you look at the original Wuhan cohort, which now seems like a long time ago, the incidence of AKI in that cohort was actually very low at about 3%. But if you really dig into the paper, and you look at the number of patients who had severe viral pneumonia, ARDS, probably about 20% of that 20% of those severe ARDS patients had AKI. And I think now what we're hearing kind of across the country is the incidence is ranging 20 to 50%, depending on the severity of the patients in your ICU. Got it, thanks. The everlasting question, fluids, diuretics. We heard early on reports that these patients were very, very sensitive to diuretics. Tell us about how you think about diuretic management in patients with COVID and ARDS. Yeah, so in general, I think as you've heard, you know, I, I like to adhere to the fact, again, we have evidence-based protocols. I like the facts protocols. So remember, so that would be diuresis for patients with ARDS when they're out of shock for 12 hours in the absence of avert AKI. So lots of sort of escape clauses there. I think my sense is that in the early stages of presentation of this disease, patients are probably can be quite volume depleted with high fevers, poor PO intake and possibly diarrhea. So I think, again, with the retrospectoscope, I think what we've learned over the course of the last few weeks is that early on, these patients may, in fact, need some volume resuscitation. And we, did not, we need to not be nervous. We need to be cautious with our volume resuscitation, but we need to also not be too nervous about the oxygen requirements, right, and get these patients volume resuscitated carefully, sort of re, kind of the way we'd, we would always sort of treat a patient like this, sort of following volume, using a couple of different parameters uh, to evaluate volume status and to keep reevaluating the need for ongoing resuscitation. Got it, thanks. We're hearing about these tragic cases where some centers are having shortages of dialysis machines, dialysis nurses, CRT machines, things like that. How would you advise hospitals in this situation? And how do you think about decisions about when to initiate renal replacement therapy? Yeah, absolutely. So that has unfortunately been a very common phenomenon, both on the East Coast and in Europe. Um, you know, so I think a couple of things. I think we've learned, as we just talked about sort of with the fluid management component, I think being careful to avoid, to avoid over-diuresing someone in the early phases is an important potential strategy. In terms of when to start dialysis, we actually have data from two large randomized clinical trials of critically ill patients looking at the timing of dialysis initiation. And both of the studies interestingly suggest that there's not necessarily a benefit to early initiation of dialysis. In fact, in both of those studies, patients were where dialysis was not initiated when patients met criteria to get into the study, out of thirds wound up recovering and not needing dialysis. Um, so I think uh, sometimes we can wait a little bit. I will say that in those studies, I think two important considerations are that in addition to the metabolic criteria to start dialysis, patients could start dialysis in the late arm if they had significant hypoxemia or if they had persistent AKI. And those were often considerations for dialysis. So in the context of severe ARDS, I wouldn't necessarily wait for the metabolic criteria. I would really look carefully at the study. Um, so I think in terms of sort of what to do in terms of shortages, there's sort of a few practical things, right? For patients on intermittent dialysis, you know, we've thought about this for our end-stage renal disease patients, either because you don't have the machines or the nurses, it may be reasonable to wait three days between dialysis sessions or until, you know, it's clear that the patient sort of needs their next dialysis session. You may be able to stretch a little bit for your intermittent dialysis program. For centers that do continuous renal re replacement therapy, there are just trade-offs to be considered. For example, a lot of places have transitioned to um, HERT therapy where you do, you use a continuous renal replacement therapy machine for about 10 hours. You can then wipe down the machine, use the machine for a second patient in a 24 hour period. The challenge with PERT therapy is you're obviously going to use more dialysis cartridges. So if you don't have the dialysis cartridges, that may not be as feasible uh, to consider. There are centers that have done acute peritoneal dialysis. And again, I think that depends on whether or not you have the skill set of nurses trained in peritoneal dialysis, surgeons who can place acute catheters. And for some places, that's been another modality that's been of use. And finally, I'll just say, I think one thing that has been a little bit different about these patients is that some of these patients are uh, 
in the setting of having an extracorporeal circuit quite hypercoagulable. So early use of anticoagulation uh, for patients on renal replacement therapy has been an important consideration to preserve filter life and to preserve supplies. Thank you for mentioning that. That's a common question that comes up too about what type of anticoagulation would you consider in patients with now AKI? So um, for the, I, I presume you mean for the circuit um, and not sort of in general, right? So exactly. for, the, for, for the circuit, I think um, it, you know, I think again, you know, one size does not fit all. I think our strategy has been that we, um, that we don't, that we, we certainly want to see if the patient is going to be hypercoagulable. If they do clot the filter, we start a, we start a modest but higher dose of anticoagulation than we typically would, and we keep reassessing. There are centers that are, um, there are centers uh, in the U.S. that are fully anticoagulating patients uh, systemically uh, for CRT. Um, you know, our local experience has not warranted that degree of anticoagulation, but, you know, obviously we're still learning a lot about this disease and its manifestations. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Back to our patient. She undergoes a brief course of renal replacement therapy, does well, improves enough to actually be extubated, and is transferred back to the respiratory isolation unit. She is soon approaching readiness for discharge. She is primarily Spanish speaking, and due to recent financial stressors, has actually had difficulty making her rent payments the last couple of months. I'd like next to introduce Dr. Nita Tucker. She's a pulmonary critical care physician, director of the ZSFG Chest Clinic, and a leading researcher on health disparities in pulmonary medicine. Dr. Tucker, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Leslie, or thank you, Lakshmi. Um, I, one, first thank you for having me here, and then also for the California Thoracic Society allowing um, space on this panel to talk about the striking disparities that we've been seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I wanted to first talk about, about how the pandemic has really been bringing light to a chronic problem in the United States and also in other developed countries. And just as we are seeing really striking racial disparities coming to light with COVID-19, we have to remember that these are the same disparities that we see across different chronic diseases, including those uh, of heart disease, lung disease, cancer, and so on and so on. Um, specifically for COVID-19, we're seeing a higher proportion of cases being overrepresented in black and brown individuals. Um, in some areas, it's almost two times the general population um, are being seen in, in African Americans. In San Francisco specifically, um, for example, Latinos make up about 15% of our demographic, but they represent about 23% or 25% of the cases. And at San Francisco General, where I practice and see patients, about 80% of our COVID cases that have been admitted have been in Latino men. And so this is just really, really striking. I think we have to take a step back and say, why are these communities at higher, such higher risk and think about the factors that place them at risk? Um, so for example, when we think about who's being exposed to the disease, we have to remember that the, the majority of our essential worker workforce, meaning those people in the food service industry, those working the janitorial and environmental services, our bus drivers, our delivery individuals are mostly minority um, individuals. In fact, a study from New York showed that 70% of essential workers are people of color. And then we also have to think about who actually gets access or has access to care. And when we think about vulnerable populations in the United States, they're predominantly provided care through a safety net system, meaning community health centers or federally qualified health centers. And with the pandemic, um, their revenue pipeline to stay open has diminished dramatically because they predominantly provide outpatient services and many of them had to close doors. So this has left many populations and groups without an, a clear way to, um, to access care, including to COVID-19 testing. And when we think about testing, we have to think about who and where are getting tests quickly. And it's usually higher resources areas, areas can be more dependent on third party 
um, testing companies and have funds to independently fund that while lower resource settings don't have those funds and have to depend on county and state responses, which are often dependent on federal response funds, which as we all know, have been quite slow. And so these factors all work together and have um, resulted in the current disparity that we see right now. What, thank you so much for raising awareness about this really important issue. And how do you, you and your colleagues at San Francisco General, you know, work to care best for these vulnerable patients? And what are some practical tips that you have, say, for example, with using interpreters in the context of using PPE and things like that? How do you ensure kind of how how do you ensure safe discharge plans as well in situations where people don't have access to stable housing or are in situations where they may have exposure to a lot of different people? Yeah, I think about it in three stages. So what can we do to prevent the disease from ever occurring? So what are our preventative things that we can do as a health system? Um, the second is what can we do to best care for patients when they have the disease? And then lastly, what can we do when we're ready for discharge and kind of thinking chron uh, like the long-term plan for their health? And so for preventative measures, what we've done at um, San Francisco General is go through all of our patient profiles to identify who we would consider high risk. So these are our patients that are marginally housed, so increased risk of exposure. Um, these are our patients with high um, comorbidities, so maybe having COPD and on oxygen therapy or have been in the emergency room in the past six months and so on. And then also those that have low health literacy. And we've been doing active outreach to those patients with using our medical assistance. And so they call them, we use a really generic phone script to ask them, are you able to shelter in place? Do you have access to food? Because that's a really important one. Do you have access to, um, are you able to financially support your housing that you have right now? And are there any concerns that you have? And then we ensure that they know about the symptoms for COVID and then also make sure that they understand the, the avenues to get testing. Um, and so that's been going on uh, for the last few weeks here in San Francisco with our system. Once a patient's admitted to the hospital, you bring up an incredibly important point about communication. And this is communication with using um, language appropriate interpreters, it's also ensuring that the patient understands what's going on, especially with individuals that may have low health literacy. And then it's also communicating with their family and loved ones who are not able to visit them in the hospital. Um, unfortunately, the reality of this across many hospitals is that our interpreters can no longer be in person. And so we're also relying on virtual um, communication, which you can imagine in full PPE, a phone and having to call an interpreter and then speak with a patient that doesn't speak the same language to you, as you is really hard. But we make a concerted effort to do that as at least once a day, ensure that the patient's questions and concerns are um, answered. And we also make an effort to contact family or friends um, to make sure that they are also connected with what's going on in the hospital. We've also had, have had tablets donated to our um, hospitals who are also able to do virtual visits with friends and families with the patients, which has been a wonderful addition um, to, to our hospital setting. And then um, just a shout out to the UCSF medical students. They also did a really lovely phone charger dr uh, drive because from an infection control risk, the, um, we cannot have phone chargers going from room to room. And so providing that ongoing lifeline for patients to connect with their family has been really instrumental. Thank you so much for sharing those tips. What about the challenges with discharging, especially to higher risk settings? Yeah, and so I think this goes into the last bucket that I was discussing, which is what do you do after the hospitalization? And so there's some of the more immediate um, concerns about where they're going and what does that setting looks like that was brought up by other panelists today. And you know, my first thing is trying to understand what is their housing. And so thinking through, is the patient homeless? Are they living in a shelter or what's called a single room occupancy where there are shared communal um, living spaces and also high risk for transmission. And often those are, those are definitely not settings that patients can go back to while they're um, recovering because um, they are high risk settings for propagating tr transmission. 
other important questions to consider asking is, and those that seem um, stably housed, is how many other people are living in the home? Are there other individuals that have that are at high risk for having a poor outcome if they were to get COVID? Um, does the patient have any caregiving responsibility, either for young ones or for elderly care? Um, many of our families are multi-generational um, homes, and so this is a really important thing to, to ask about. We also want to ask about whether or not they have access to their chronic medications, um, access to food services on a regular basis, because you can imagine you don't want this individual to be going to the grocery store. They really need to have somebody that can bring it to their home or have a delivery service um, uh, put into place. And then also one thing we start have been asking about is any fear of lost income. And this is relevant to the, um, the, the patient that you were talking about today. And also whether they have fear of losing their housing as a re result of isolation. And then once you um, go through all of these potential barriers to self-isolation that we see are common in vulnerable populations is to come up with this multi-component discharge packet. And this may be include finding a bed in what we call a dedicated COVID hotel that have been set up in the area as a safe discharge plan for patients. Um, it may be setting up food delivery for the patient with working with your local food bank or other resources that might be in the area. And then assisting with signing up for temporary disability or sick leave with their, with their employer so that they feel that they have um, that they don't have any other additional barriers and would be able to be more likely to self-isolate. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Tucker. And fortunately, our patient actually did well and was discharged to one of these COVID hotels that we set up. So that, that actually was a really good outcome with innovative work done by San Francisco General. Unfortunately, however, the patient actually had a brother who also was hospitalized with COVID-19, who had a more severe illness course, and in discussions with his medical team, they were talking about transitioning the patient to comfort care. Next, we're happy to invite Dr. Evie Kalmar from the Divisions of Geriatrics and Palliative Care to talk about palliative care principles in patients with COVID-19. Dr. Kalmar, could you talk about some of the benefits to considering an early consultation of palliative care in these situations. Uh-oh, we can't quite hear you yet, Dr. Kalmar. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. So thank you so much for having me. I was uh, just like that, there are a number of studies that have demonstrated multiple benefits to early palliative care consults. And some of the benefits have included improved quality of life, decreased healthcare utilization before death, and often in the outpatient setting. So it might not be relevant during the current pandemic. There are some studies that look at triggered palliative care consults in the ICU if patients meet certain criteria. And these are more relevant in the context of patients admitted to the hospital with COVID-19. These studies have similarly shown decreased healthcare utilization compared to standard care with benefits such as fewer ventilator days, fewer tracheostomies, and fewer post-discharge ED visits or readmissions. Um, as Dr. Ismaili mentioned, if clinical trajectory is worsening um, for a patient in the hospital, it's often a good time to consider having conversations with patients and families about um, what you can do today, you know, if things continue to worsen. And in the context of COVID, many palliative care teams are exploring increased integration with the ED, hospital, and ICU teams to start palliative care involvement earlier. And there are similar complementary efforts to have proactive conversations about advanced care planning with high-risk patients before they get sick or in the hospital. And the more that these conversations can be happening early, even before the hospital or early in the hospital course, and before people need ICU level care, the better. That makes a lot of sense, Dr. Kalmar. Thank you for bringing that up. And on the flip side, you know, you've talked about the benefits to early palliative care consultation. 
Can you talk about our unique challenges in the setting of COVID-19, particularly with all the visitor restrictions? Of course. So there are a lot of unique challenges, and I'm just going to highlight a few here. I think in general, in palliative care, we like to start getting to know our patients first so that we can make sure we really understand who they are as people and make sure that the care that they're receiving is aligned with their wishes and their values. And this is, can be really hard to do in the context of COVID if people arrive already very sick or haven't previously discussed their health care wishes with loved ones. And unfortunately, once patients are hospitalized, you know, they can be quite sick, symptomatic, even intubated, and may not be in a place where they can engage in these conversations. And I think, as you mentioned, additionally, the visitor policies mean that patients are often alone and isolated from their loved ones, which can be scary and traumatic both for the patients and families and really make it hard to coordinate these conversations with everyone involved. It can also make it really hard for families to understand how sick their loved ones are if they can't be present and see them in person. So one other thing I'll mention is that, you know, prognostication and equipping patients and their loved ones with guidance about what to expect is always hard, but it's even more difficult with a virus that we're only starting to learn about. And then the last challenge is that the separation of patients from their loved ones can often lead to significant grief and bereavement um, after death for families, especially if they haven't had a chance to say goodbye to their loved ones, or as in this situation, if there are multiple family members who have been struck in by COVID-19. Well, thank you for the amazing you know, work that your team does with these patients. Many hospitals don't actually have dedicated palliative care teams, or it's becoming an increasingly scarce resource in these pandemic times. So what advice do you have for primary teams, intensive care unit teams, and hospital medicine teams about talking to patients and incorporating these sort of primary principles of palliative care? Yeah, so, you know, obviously, if your hospital does have access to palliative care, I want to remind you that your palliative care colleagues are here to help during these difficult times. And even in places uh, like New York and New Orleans, where, where, you know, it's not quite a surge, but things are much more serious and difficult, um, there's a lot of attention to trying to incorporate the palliative care team into the ICU team so that they can be helpful in having these conversations earlier on. But for those of you without access to palliative care, I wanted to let you know about a really wonderful resource from an organization called Vital Talk. Um, if you go to Google and type in Vital Talk and COVID, the toolkit that they created is the first toolkit that will come up. And what I really love about this resource is that they've created multiple conversation guides that can be used with patients and their loved ones. And there's different sections on how to respond to frequently asked questions by patients and families, how to cancel and to provide support around emotions that may come up, how to help families say goodbye by phone, and other kind of useful resources that may be, be helpful if you don't have the, the availability of palliative care. And then I think the last thing that I'll say is that this is an incredibly hard time for so many people, both patients and families and providers alike. And so I just wanted to thank you all for the work that you're doing and showing up and being human and present with your patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalmar, and thank you for acknowledging that this is really hard for patients and caregivers alike. So thank you all for joining this panel. Thank you all for participating in the webinar. A quick round of applause to our panelists. And now I'm gonna actually turn it over to my co-host, Dr. Aaron Gordon, who's gonna moderate a Q&A with our panelists. So if all of our panelists who are able to turn their video on, we'll be directing our questions from the audience that are very thoughtful towards you right now. So thank you. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, we've got lots of questions for you, Jeff, um, particularly about um, novel therapeutics. Um, I wanna start with this question about what we know about the role of microthrombosis in the pathology of COVID and uh, what, uh, what is your approach to using anticoagulation? Are you choosing a level of a D-dimer and then deciding to anticoagulate? Are you restricting it to patients only who have a known clot? Um, that's the question. I'm here unmute myself. Um, really important question um, that uh, I, didn't, I didn't really have time to get into before. So, you know, clots are really common in, 
severe critical illness. Uh, nobody, I hope, disputes that. I mean, a series of influenza, immediate ARDS, the DVTP rate are, you know, is north of 20, 30 percent. Um, and so this has some appeal to people, understandably. Uh, but, um, you know, I want to, I would caution us uh, that just um, because there are increased rates of clot and damaged lungs, which is, no one would dispute that, and, and that's true for almost any kind of ARDS, um, it's not necessarily the case that they're going to have better outcomes by just giving everybody therapeutic anticoagulation. I, I remember a formative experience for me early in my attending days of a young man I had cared for with very severe influenza, ARDS, who died, and, and looking at the autopsy specimens of, of the lungs, um, they were trashed. There was clot everywhere, there was blood everywhere, and you know, you might have clotting in situ in really damaged pulmonary blood vessels that if you lice those clots, it's just gonna hemorrhage. Um, so I think we really need to take a step back from this. Um, it, you know, it, it's clear it would be great if we could optimize the balance of clotting and bleeding in this disease. But I don't think we know how to do that. And, and I, would, I would really caution us to not embrace these really aggressive anticoagulation protocols until we have some good RCT evidence of you know, how we should do this. Um, we've, we've seen complications already in patients given empiric heparin, um, intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, we haven't seen it so much at our place yet, but they've been reported. Um, and it's not a surprise. We are well familiar with the consequences of anticoagulating critically ill patients. We've all seen these complications, GI bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage. So I just say, look, we're, I, I don't think we should go beyond, my opinion is we shouldn't go beyond standard prophylactic dosing uh, uh, for DVTPE until we have better evidence to guide us. Second question for you, Jeff. We'll get, try to get you all out of the way. Um, lots of questions about what UCSF is doing in terms of experimental therapies. Uh, for example, remdesivir um, uh, recovered patient plasma, um, as well as drugs like tocopolizumab, the anti-IL-6. So that's the first question. What is UCSF doing? And then the, the follow-up to that is, um, for drugs that are available for off-label use, uh, what would you recommend to providers who are out in the community who don't have access to uh, enrolling their patient in a randomized trial? Yeah, sorry, this is a question for me, Erin. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Matt, Matt, feel free to jump in here too. Sure. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, so the trials we have going on right now, uh, we have a big, um, we have a lot of them. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but we have a big observational trial that uh, Carolyn Calfee uh, uh, has helped to organize called Comet, where we're getting biospecimens from lots of patients. We've already enrolled 30, 40 patients. Um, we have uh, so, you know, a trial of mesenchymal stromal cells run by Michael Mathay here um, uh, for severe ARDS that predated this. This is just for ARDS, and it, and it happened to coincide with this outbreak. Uh, and uh, the remdesivir trial, uh, it recruited well here. I think we had 11 patients enrolled. It's currently you know, paused and will resume uh, in a modified form shortly. Um, you know, what, what should we do for off-label use of things? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I, you know, I, I don't think we should be using stuff off-label um, until we have better evidence. Uh, I mean, I think that we're starting to see some alarming reports about hydroxychloroquine, and uh, it's not a surprise to, to anybody, I hope. I mean, we, we should have learned this lesson by now in critical care that you, you just, you got to do the studies. Um, don't just give people stuff that has side effects um, if you don't know it's going to be helpful. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, we've talked a lot about this in our, in both in our critical care group, uh, and we also have a larger multidisciplinary um, clinical planning group at UCSF that includes, I think we're up to 30 plus people from, um, from various divisions at, at UCSF. And, and we've taken, I would say, to be a, what we believe to be an appropriate and appropriately conservative approach to this. Uh, we have not gone forward with immune-based therapy. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we've, I, we've been, uh, also very cautious with the use of steroids. And I recognize that this is different than the practice that many of you have seen reported um, from other institutions, certainly from, uh, from a number of institutions that have published on, on this uh, topic uh, from Italy. And, I, and by published, I mean there's been publication of protocols or there has been posting of protocols. But I think we need to make an important distinction between a protocol that's posted online and something that's actually supported by a randomized controlled trial. Um, and so I think just in general, and, and similarly with just the approach to, to coagulation disorders, um, 
even some of the studies that have looked, the studies that have come out from China, including uh, the, 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 um, the study from Tang and colleagues from China, just because there may have been some subset of patients who appeared to do better um, with, uh, with anticoagulation, if you read the details of these, I mean, this may just be the patients who have done better where they actually got prophylactic treatment um, for, for VTE. So, um, we've tried to, to stay conservative and just stay anchored to what we know is, is supported by the evidence uh, broadly in critical care and not get beyond that. As a follow-up to that, Matt, that's great. Um, can you comment? Um, I know we haven't published UCSF's data on our mortality rates, and I know we're a little bit early in the game here, but we know out of China, mortality in intubated patients was somewhere around 80%, and we uh, are hearing about similar reports out of Italy. Why, why do you think UCSF's experience in terms of mortality has been different than that, or even San Francisco in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we can speak broadly for us, you know, for, for um, at UCSF Health and, and for uh, Zuckerberg, uh, San Francisco General, where they've actually had uh, over the last several weeks a larger number of patients, both on the wards and in the ICU. I, I think our, our mortality in large part, I suspect has been driven by the fact that we've just had the resources and the time. I don't think this is, this certainly isn't a matter of some um, elaborate experimental protocol where we have sort of sorted out the, the pathophysiology of COVID-19 in a way that anybody else hasn't. It, that's not the case. It's just been, we've not been in the surge situation. So when a patient is hypoxemic on the floor, we've been able to escalate care. We've been able to get them to the ICU. We've been able to watch them carefully and patients for whom high flow nasal cannula is appropriate and we can avoid intubation. We've had the luxury of time. We can watch them, you know, make frequent check-ins, five, 10 minutes, see where they are. We've had appropriate nursing ratios. We've had respiratory therapists who can be in the room for extended periods of times because they're not seeing 50 other patients. I mean, all of those things, when you look at mortality rates, including data that was published in, in, in JAMA today from, from one of the New York city systems, um, and, and you couple that with the stories that we've all heard in the, both the, the accounts, you know, whether it be in the New York Times or personal communications we have from colleagues, we know the nursing ratios are vastly different. We know providers who are not hospitalists are taking care of patients in, on the acute care wards. We know that the providers who are from different non-critical care specialties are being asked to come to the ICU. It's not surprising based on that, that, that the outcomes um, are worse. And so, you know, we'll continue to do what we can um, given the resources that we have. And, you know, we're obviously in California. I think you know, all of us who live here, and we're all in different levels of, of, um, um, of, uh, of busyness in our own ICUs, but I think we're all grateful to be, you know, in a state that fortunately, you know, started sheltering in place early. Um, and for many institutions, canceled elective cases early. And that gave us, it gave us time and space. And that, that thus far, and granted, I want to be cautious, this is early, our sample size is relatively low. I think we're all reluctant to make any grand proclamations here, but it's given us, it's given us the time that we need um, to practice the way that we want to be able to practice. Matt, we've got like two minutes left. What about codes? Tell us what's the UCSF approach to coding patients with COVID? Um, again, I'll be cautious. We've been, um, we've been fortunate. And so I, I think, um, you know, our approach again is I mean, provider safety is, is paramount. And so people need to be wearing appropriate PPE. We do not need 20 people in the room. Um, so we have limited to a restricted number of providers. Um, we do twice daily code huddles at our institution. Anyhow, we've done this for, for uh, quite some time long before um, the pandemic. And those have been huddles where we've been able to talk about patients that are vulnerable, that we're concerned about. We've also done similar huddling with our, our colleagues out on the respiratory illness unit. So we've been able to also plan for patients that might need an escalation of care. Um, but it's a challenge. I mean, I think anybody, we've had, um, we have had some code scenarios, particularly in, in, in patients under investigation. Communication in and out of the room is a challenge. We've experimented with our Volt phones, you know, sort of our iPhone-based communication devices. Those are loud, they're loud. It's loud in the room, it's loud out of the room. That's challenging. Um, we've done some written, you know, whiteboard type communication. That also is challenging. 
I'll say we're fortunate enough right now. We just haven't had um, that many events. Um, and so we, I hope we can, that can continue to be the case. But, um, you know, there's probably important lessons to be learned from other institutions that have had much, you know, uh, a much larger number um, in the practices that they found to be helpful. Well, I wish we had time for each of you really to spend your own hour on this webinar. It's been an incredibly high yield hour. And I wanna thank each and every one of you panelists for really sharing your time and expertise and really distilling it to a couple of high yield clinical pearls. And thanks again to California Thoracic Society, UCSF Critical Care Medicine and UCSF Division of Hospital Medicine for bringing together these wonderful panelists. Uh, really appreciate all of you for tuning in. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.